Hello and a very warm welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Breakfast News with me, Frank Pereira. As always, let's begin with the latest headlines. India slams bail to 2611 suspect Zakir Rahman Lakhvi. Pakistani prosecution says it will appeal the court's decision. Government tallies fears for India about Russian economic crisis after ruble suffers steepest fall in nearly two decades. Cold wave conditions spread in North India, train and flight disruptions in many cities. And campaigning ends for the assembly polls in Jammu and Kashmir and Jharkhand. Final phase of polls to be held on the 20th of December, that is on Saturday. Top focus on the bulletin this morning. Key accused in the 2611 attacks, Zakir Rahman Lakhvi, was uh, granted bail by the Pakistani court yesterday. The court's decision comes only a day after Pakistani Prime Minister announced his government's resolve to eliminate all terrorists from its soil. Lakhvi's bail sparked a strong reaction in India. The centre is working with its mission in Pakistan to prepare a strong response. Here's more. Zakir Rahman Lakhvi, one of the most wanted terrorists on India's list, has walked out on bail despite Pakistan's top investigating agency's opposition. He was granted bail by a Pakistan anti-terrorism court on Thursday on a bond of 5 lakh Pakistani rupees. Lakhvi is allegedly the man behind planning and execution of 166 people in Mumbai six years ago. The court's decision has left the centre outraged. India has been demanding Lakhvi to be handed over for trial in the 2611 case. The government is working with its mission in Pakistan to prepare a strong response to it. Minister Srimati Susma Swaraj, who is external affairs, I understand that they will be able to talk to this issue in this issue. और मैं भी उनसे बातचीत करूंगा अभी तो मैं यही उम्मीद करता हूं कि जो भी एविडेंसेस भारत सरकार के द्वारा प्रोवाइड किए गए हैं वह पर्याप्त हैं जकीर रहमान लखवी को सजा देने के लिए और जल्दी से जल्दी पाकिस्तान गवर्नमेंट के द्वारा इसकी अपील Incidentally, on Wednesday, Pakistan's Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif vowed to eliminate the last of the terrorists left in Pakistan. His announcement came a day after Taliban's ghastly attack in which 148 people, mostly children, were killed. India questioned the Pakistan government's intent to rein in the terror elements on its soil. The grant of bail to Lakhvi will serve as a reassurance to terrorists who perpetuate heinous crimes. We call upon the government of Pakistan to immediately take steps to reverse this decision. There can be no selective approaches to terrorism. We have been asking for the arrest of uh, Hafiz Saeed for quite some time. As you may know, there is actually a reward from the Americans out for him. He is on the United Nations list. His organization, the Jamaat Dawa, is banned as a terrorist organization internationally. So Pakistan is in flagrant violation of international law in allowing this man to flourish, to travel, to make speeches. We have given much more voluminous evidence to the Pakistan prosecuting it. You have failed to adduce that evidence in a proper manner, and that is the reason. Even then, still the time has not gone. He immediately make an appeal to the appeal to the High Court and cancel the bail. Lakhvi co-founded the lashkar e taiba which is banned in Pakistan. The group's other founder, Hafiz Saeed, also accused by India of masterminding the 2611 attacks, already roams free in Pakistan. Bureau report, Raj Sabha TV. Well, 16 Taliban militants, including Pakistan Taliban chief Mullah Fazullah and uh, his deputy Khalid Haqqani, were named in an FIR in the Peshawar school massacre. Here's more. Pakistani authorities filed cases against Pakistan Taliban chief Mullah Fazlullah, his deputy Khalid Haqqani and 14 other Talibani commanders in the Peshawar school massacre. Names of the terrorists who carried out attack were also mentioned. At least 141 people including 132 school children were killed in the terror attack. Abhi crimes jo investigation hai, they are trying to jitni bhi yahan se ko collect kar sakte hai, evidence crime scene ke upar. We are trying to find out and we will get to it and then we will do it further. But outside the political arena, people remain skeptical about the intentions of the administration and its leaders. 
go to Nawaz Sharif, you go to Bilal Bhutto, you go to Zardar, you go to anyone, and they will have a list of Taliban commanders living in that area. Do they have the more responsibility to come on television, make the faces of these bloody peoples public, declare them as killers, make them afraid of their own bloody shadow that the entire street should know that you are a killer of our children. Stop putting them in hiding and stop protecting these people. I'm here to protest and condemn Taliban with the strongest feelings that I hate Taliban and I want them to get out of my country. Afghanistan has also assured Pakistan of strong action against the Taliban terrorists hiding in its territory. The promise comes as combining operations are underway in various Taliban hideouts in Pakistan. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, joining me for a chat this morning on this very subject is uh, former diplomat Yogendra Kumar. Very good morning, Mr. Kumar, and thank you for joining me on the program. You know, uh, on one hand, you have the Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif that he's uh, who's come out and said that you know he's going to strike down with uh, on terror with an iron fist. There's, there, there's not going to be any kind of a difference between good Taliban and bad Taliban. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you have someone like uh, Zakir Rahman Lakwi being granted bail. I mean, what kind of a message is being sent out? I think this is a very important point you make. Because these two incidents, the Peshawar massacre and the, and the bail being done to Lakhvi, in a way the test of Pakistan as a state to mm. what extent it is actually determined to combat terror, which not only is stalking the, I mean, the people of Pakistan, but also the neighborhood. So I think it's a very important point. And what we have to see now is to what extent Pakistani state by which I mean the ruling establishment, mm. whether it's the military or the political forces or the administration, to what extent they are able to make the psychological switch, which is what is necessary today. Mm. Because as you would notice between the, in these two incidents, one relates to India, the other one, actually they are not talking to Afghanistan about yeah, that. Yeah. And like we have been talking about good and bad Taliban, and Prime Minister Sharif saying that there is no distinction between mm. good and bad Taliban. If you recall, when President Abdul Ghani had gone to uh, Kathmandu at the Sark summit, he made exactly the same point about uh, what kind of terrorism is there which is being state-sponsored. Mm. So, so these two things are actually ex extremely critical. And in a way, it is now, as I see, it is also something which is, you can say, even existential as far as Pakistan is concerned. Mm. So that's why this is actually a very critical development, which is what we have to watch. As far as the, the, the bail is concerned, I think it's very clear that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the reason why the bail is not granted to people who are accused of such heinous crimes is that they should not influence the course of prosecution. Yes. There are still many witnesses to be examined, cross-examined uh, by the prosecution in this particular trial. But this particular trial, as you know, this was the subject of the Obama Modi communique when mm, mm. the Prime Minister had gone to Washington, that the trial should be expeditious, it should be effective, and which is what we are seeing, that all along, I mean, this, this trial was instituted right in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. Since that time, the trial has been uh, plagued by slow process, uh, inadequate security for the judges and the prosecutors, as you know, one judge recused himself by saying that, uh, you know, security is not adequate. Mm. On the other hand, one of the prosecutors, as uh, was mentioned on, in your program, uh, the prosecutor actually was, was, was killed by yes. these people. That's yes. why these things are very important. Mm. And there are again six more bail applications pending before the, 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 the current court. So these are actually extremely critical issues. Yeah, well, they are extremely critical issues and something that needs to be addressed, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. Mm. You know, the people on the ground in Pakistan as well are fed up of terrorism. They want something to be done. They want concrete steps to be taken. But can these concrete steps really be taken? Well... In fact, that is precisely the point. To what extent does Pakistan feel, realize now, that its policy of being state sponsors of terrorism, mm. to what extent that policy is now actually self-destructive? It, it is destructive of Pakistan itself. What we tell Pakistan, the Afghan leaders are saying the same, same thing to thing, them. Yes. Because, I mean, again, the question about, like, uh, the chief of the army staff of Pakistan had gone to Kabul and met uh, the president and the head of the, 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 the American general in charge of the ISAF. The same point that please hand over this terrorist to us because, or, or allow us to mm. pursue mm. Uh, the terrorist into your territory. Something which actually, to me, it's a hint of a threat as well. Because the fact that now this massacre is taking place in Peshawar actually is putting a lot of heat on the, on the chief of the army staff of Pakistan mm. because they were actually affecting their own personnel. Mm. So the whole issue now is becoming so complicated in that sense. And Pakistan is now actually finding itself in an extremely uh, invidious situation, 
But again, the question really is that when you handle a, a situation like this, which actually become a phenomenon, how strong are you internally to actually take on this kind yes, of a threat? Yes, and handle the situation. Yeah, exactly. You know, the timing of the bail is uh, rather questionable also, isn't it? I mean, you have a massacre that has taken place where over 130 children have been killed for the first time in the history of the world. And on the other hand, a day later, you know, someone like a, a, a someone like a Zakir Rahman Lakhvi is, is freed. I mean, even the timing is rather questionable, isn't it? Well, I would not know whether there is an element of deliberation in this. But it's certainly interesting to see that the discourse on these two subjects, mm. the Peshawar massacre and the leave and, and the bail to Lakhvi, the discourse in Pakistan is actually quite different. I mean, for example, on the TV uh, uh, programs, when you find the Pakistani spokespersons or Pakistani commentators coming on, they actually are linking up the, the Mumbai terror attack with some other issues, mm, mm. whereas they are not actually looking at this, that what is actually happening is something which is affecting them as well. I Indeed. mean, after all, Lashkar Taiba is a banned organization mm. in Pakistan too. Yes. And, uh, and Lakhvi uh, is in fact the head of the operations of, of Lashkar and Taiba. Yes. So the point is that when it comes to the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, prosecution or the, the court process as far as the Mumbai trial, attack, trial is concerned, you find that the discourse in Pakistan is not quite the same mm. as it is on Peshawar. So mm. that actually is something which we should observe and note. Indeed, all right. We'll have to yeah. leave it at that. Thank you so much, Yogendra Kumar, for joining us on the program this morning and sharing your views with us. Thank you. Well, moving on now, with just three working days remaining for the winter session to enter the impasse over uh, conversion and ro the row, of course, continue to dominate proceedings in the upper house. Uh, Rajya Sabha was repeatedly adjourned as the opposition MPs stuck to their demand that the Prime Minister Narendra Modi should make a statement on the matter. This is the fourth straight day that work in the upper house got hampered due to protest. Here's more. Rajya Sabha Chairman Mohammad Hamid Ansari suspended the question hour on Thursday to take up discussion on communal flare-up in the country. If an individual member suggests the suspension of a rule and for which the chair has to give permission, then the chair has to be satisfied that there is a broad consensus about such suspension. Okay, now... One request has come, the Honorable Leader of uh, the House has said that from their side, they do not have any problem with it. So I assume that there is broad consensus about this matter. Slamming the government on religious conversions, United Opposition demanded response from the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who was present in the House. प्रधानमंत्री the government, however, rejected the demand and pressed for Home Minister's reply. It also lashed out at the opposition for derailing the functioning of the House. The fact that out of two houses, one is functioning normally and the other is not being allowed to function normally, it's the arrogance of numbers and not the arrogance of the government. Let the discussion start. And as per the rules, as per the president, the concerned minister will definitely respond. One more effort was made in the post-lunch session to bring an end to the stalemate between government and opposition. But government once again rejected the demand, saying the Home Minister will reply to the debate on this issue. प्रधान मंत्री जी की मौजूदगी लंच आवर के पहले यहां पर थी और चर्चा होने का फैसला हो चुका था उसके बाद उसके बावजूद हमारे सम्मानित विपक्ष के सदस्यगण ने चर्चा इस सदन में इतने गंभीर विषय पर नहीं होने With both sides not willing to budge from their respective stands, the proceedings were adjourned for the fourth consecutive day. With Kuti Mishra, Vishal Dahiya, Rajya Sabha TV, Delhi. Out the houses are going to meet tomorrow Friday at 11.
And while the government is not mulling any proposal to reduce the retirement age of central government employees from 60 to 58 years, the government said this is in response uh, to a question raised in the Rajya Sabha. It puts an end to the speculation of reduction in retirement age. In a written reply in Rajya Sabha, Minister of State for Personnel, Public Revances and Pensions, Jitendra Singh said that the government was not contemplating reducing the retirement age. His response reads, and I quote, the retirement age for central government employees was revised from 58 to 60 years in 1997 on the basis of recommendations of the 5th Central Pay Commission and that there is no such proposal at present to reduce the age. Unquote. To a query whether the centre was aware of the Haryana government's move to reduce the retirement age of its employees, the minister replied in the affirmative, saying that state governments had their own service conditions for their employees. Jitendra Singh also ruled out any proposal to fix single retirement age limit policy in all state governments and PSUs in the country. He also informed the House that 78% of the total wage bill of the government was being spent on just three departments – railways, home and defence. Kriti Mishra's report for Rajya Sabha TV. Well, it's time for a short break now, but much more lined up on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television. Well, winter has intensified its grip over North India with several areas reeling under freezing cold and thick fog affecting normal life in vast swathes of the plains, causing widespread inconvenience and delays in road and air traffic. Here's a detailed report. Delhi woke up to a cold and foggy morning on Friday with several flight delays at the Indira Gandhi International Airport. Many places in Jammu, Punjab, Haryana, South Himachal Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh also witnessed dense fog. In Delhi, people shivered due to a dip in the night temperatures. Poor people forced to live on the city streets were the worst hit. We are on a rickshaw, and we are on a food. And the cold has been so cold. Maximum temperatures are below normal by 5 to 8 degrees Celsius at many places over Punjab, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. Hilly areas are witnessing incessant snowfall. In the coming time, the weather will be clean for one week, the weather will increase the weather and the weather will not have any changes in the night. The Met Department has predicted no significant change in minimum temperatures. The Met Department has predicted no significant change in minimum temperatures over northwest India during the next 48 hours. Fresh western disturbance would affect western Himalayan region from 21st of December on Sunday, causing more snowfall. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, moving on from the freezing conditions in northwest India to a news from the pole-bound states of Jammu and Kashmir and Jharkhand. Campaigning ended in both the states ahead of the fifth and final phase of polling on Saturday. As the fifth and last phase of polls near, uh, near in Jammu and Kashmir and Jharkhand, let's take a look at the figures on the ground and what's at stake in this round. All the hurly-burlies done, the players for this phase were finalized on the 6th of December and over the last two weeks they've pulled out all stops to woo the voter. Once again it's over to the election commission and ultimately the voter who has the final say. The remaining 20 constituencies of Jammu and Kashmir go to polls in the fifth phase, which includes four seats in Rajori district, five in Katwa and 11 segments in Jammu. Some 18.2 lakh voters are eligible to cast their franchise in this phase. 213 candidates are contesting for the 20 seats. 14 candidates contesting in this phase have criminal cases pending against them. The fifth phase is seen above all as critical to the BJP's Mission 44 Plus and its poll dreams for Jammu and Kashmir. The party banks on continuance of the so-called Modi wave and the anti-incumbency factor in the region. The Prime Minister and other party bigwigs have addressed multiple rallies in the run-up. For the Congress, Deputy Chief Minister and three-time MLA Tara Chand faces a tough battle this time in Cham seat in Jammu that borders Pakistan. 
The area has borne the onslaught of park gunfire and shelling as well as flood fury over the last few years. In Jharkhand, door-to-door -door canvassing to Mohalla road shows and rallies by local leaders and party bigwigs, the campaign fever that has gripped the state for a month and more over the five phases has wound up. 16 assembly segments go to polls in the fifth phase of voting on the 20th of December. These areas are spread over five districts of Sahib Ganj, Pakur, Dumka, Gorda and Deoghar in the extreme eastern belt of the state. Some 36.9 lakh voters will decide the fate of 208 candidates in the fray for the 16 seats going to polls in this phase. 59 have declared criminal cases against themselves, according to ADR. Jharkhand has consistently returned a 60% plus voter turnout in all the phases of voting so far. Areas with a high Maoist threat, places like Giridi, Bokaro and Dhanbad saw a high voter turnout. The state is going to the fourth assembly polls in 14 years since its formation. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha Television. Going on to some international news now, Russian President Vladimir Putin has pledged to fix Russia's economic problems within two years by diversifying away from its heavy reliance on oil and gas and voiced confidence that the plummeting ruble will soon recover. Speaking uh, with the strong emotion during a live news conference that lasted more than three hours, Putin displayed his traditional defiant stance toward uh, the West, which he insisted is trying to destroy Russia to grab Siberia's great natural resources. But ordinary Russians remain skeptical of his plans. Here's more. Defiant and confident. President Vladimir Putin is assuring Russians that the economy will rebound after the ruble's dramatic slide. But even as he blamed the West, Putin conceded systemic flaws were also to blame. Конечно, сегодняшняя ситуация спровоцирована внешними факторами прежде всего. Но исходим из того, что нами многое не сделано из того, что мы планировали сделать и говорили о том, что мы должны сделать по диверсификации нашей экономики в течение практически предыдущих 20 лет. Although Putin said recovery might take two years, much will depend on how long the West maintains sanctions on Russia for its role in the Ukraine crisis. Мне нужно воспользоваться этой ситуацией, чтобы дополнительно создать условия для производственного бизнеса и диверсификации экономики. Вот надеюсь, что сегодняшняя именно сегодняшняя конъюнктура поможет нам это сделать. For now, the U.S. is keeping in place the Russian sanctions passed by Congress. Signing the legislation does not, however, signal a change in the administration's sanctions policy, uh, which we have carefully calibrated in accordance with developments on the ground and coordinated with our allies and partners principally in Europe. Uh, at this time, the administration does not intend to impose sanctions under this law. Even as he ignored pressure to say how he will fix an economy, Putin blamed NATO for the worst relations between Moscow and the West in decades. Свои вооруженные силы выдвигаем границам Соединенных Штатов либо других государств. Базы кто двигает к нам НАТО? Военную инфраструктуру? Не мы. Нас кто-нибудь слушает? Хоть какой-то диалог с нами по этому поводу ведут? Нет, вообще никакого. Всегда в ответ только одно. Не ваше дело. Western media interpreted Putin's three-hour press conference in Moscow as an effort to show Russians that he was in command. But ordinary residents seemed divided. Экономика неизбежно приспособится к условиям жизни, к условиям низких цен на энергоносители. И она будет обязательно диверсифицироваться. И второе. Даже если мы исходим из того, что низкие цены будут сохраняться на энергоносители даже будут снижаться, неизбежно наступит момент. Putin also dismissed a possibility that somebody from his inner circle may stage a coup as a result of the currency crisis. Насчет дворцовых переводов успокойтесь. У нас нет дворцов. Поэтому переводов дворцовых быть не может. У нас есть официальная резиденция Кремль. Она хорошо защищена. И это тоже фактор нашей государственной стабильности. Но стабильность основана не на этом. Она основана и не может быть никакой другой более прочной базы, чем поддержка российского народа.
Despite the anti-Western rhetoric, Putin urged a political solution for Ukraine. He also held out hope for normalizing ties with the West, saying that Russia still hopes to expand its gas supplies to southern Europe using a prospective gas hub on Turkey's border with Greece. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Meanwhile, economic experts have warned that the Russian currency crisis could spill over to other emerging economies, especially India. But the government is discounting such fears. Here's more. Emerging economies like India are worried by the 30% depreciation of the ruble against the US dollar. The weak growth in other developed nations like Japan has only added to these concerns. India is keeping a close watch on the Russian economy. For only last week, both nations pledged to travel bilateral trade to $30 billion in the next 10 years. Russia, of course, is very deeply exposed to the commodity cycle. And as we all know, oil prices have declined very dramatically and overall commodities have also declined. So as a result of that, uh, and in addition to that, the sanctions that Russia is uniquely facing have created a very difficult situation for them. India and Russia agreed to jointly explore oil and gas, build petrochemical plants and pipelines and also cooperate in infrastructure development and smart cities. Russia also announced its intention to jointly produce 400 light utility helicopters and help build smart cities in India. Overall, the global economy seems to be moving in a positive direction. Uh, Abe-san has won a very strong and important mandate in Japan. Uh, the European Union uh, is moving aggressively to, uh, to uh, uh, introduce growth impulses in their economy. The US economy is doing well. You heard what the Fed had to say yesterday. So all in all, I think the global economy will be able to handle the disruption that we're seeing in Russia right now. In the short term, India can gain from Western sanctions against Russia by purchasing cheaper oil, gas and even cutting and polishing rough diamonds. But a sustained crisis could spell trouble, as foreign investors could then start withdrawing capital from emerging economies for other safe options. Krishnan Tripathi's report for Rajya Sabha TV. Let's now bring you up to date with the other news-making stories from around the world in our World Wrap. Boko Haram militants killed 32 people and kidnapped 200, including women and children, in northeastern Nigeria. The attack was believed to have occurred in the remote village of uh, Gumsuri on Sunday. This is the second such case of abduction by Boko Haram militants since April. The US did not rule out a visit to the White House by Cuban President Raul Castro on Thursday. The news comes a day after the US resumed relations with Cuba. Indian-American retaliator Sant Singh Chathwal was uh, sentenced to three years of probation for illegally donating thousands of dollars to political campaigns. Chathwal is an Indian Padma Bhushan awardee and a major fundraiser for former U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. He pleaded guilty in April for violating the Federal Election Campaign Act by making more than $180,000 campaign donations uh, to three candidates. Over to some sports news now. Day three of the second Commonwealth Bank test in Brisbane, Australian skipper Steve Smith made a superb 100 on his captaincy debut to take his side to 351 runs for six wickets at lunch. Smith found some aggressive support in Mitchell Johnson, who has made 67 not out from just 53 deliveries at lunch. Smith was not dismissed by India in last week's Adelaide test win with scores of 162 and 52. Well, that's it on this edition of The Bulletin. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day.